Christian mothers are zealous for worship. They want reverence. And so do all who know Jesus Christ. And this worship of God is also what God is most zealous about. That's exactly what we see in our passage this morning in John chapter 2. We're going to see three points related to zeal. Those three points are, first of all, Jesus' aggressive zeal, man's depraved zeal, and then Jesus' resurrection zeal. Aggressive zeal, depraved zeal, and resurrection zeal. And our first point uh, I felt was so important that I found myself constantly adding to it. And so last week we spent the entire message on just that one point. And today we're finishing up. We're wrapping up with points two and three. Uh, but we'll spend just a minute uh, reviewing that first point again. And that is this, that Jesus is aggressively zealous for worship. But, and again, I want to ask the question, like, I mean, does that bother you, especially you mothers? Aggressive? Jesus? Well, look at verse 15 again. Jesus made a whip. And when Jesus made that whip, he then used it. It wasn't decorative. It wasn't part of his ensemble. They weren't passing out whips as they entered the sanctuary that day. No, Jesus made a whip, and then he used a whip and he used it at least on things like sheep and oxen that we see in the temple. But notice that that's an additional clause. It says, with sheep and oxen. He whipped all of them out of the temple, including people, meaning in some way Jesus used a whip on people. Excuse me? This is not the Jesus that my mother told me about. Well, um, this is the Jesus that's presented to us here in this text, and we have to ask what is going on here what are we to make of jesus with a whip why would he bring a whip to church well it's because of what man in sin had done to worship and that brings us to our second point that man's depraved zeal destroys worship man's depraved zeal destroys worship the religious leaders had already done this they had destroyed worship in the temple by perverting its purpose Jesus himself describes the problem for us. He says it in verse 16, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Jesus says that the buying and selling they were doing in the temple changed the nature of the temple from a house dedicated to the father's worship to a house of trade, a, a house of merchandise, a, a marketplace, a, a religious mall, a, a tourist trap. And note in verse 14 that it doesn't even specify what we know from the other gospel accounts, that this was actually happening in the, the Gentile court, the outer court of the temple. It just says very simply, in the temple. And I think this is on purpose. I think because in Jesus' eyes, in God's eyes, what they were doing struck at the very heart of the temple's purpose. Uh, it, it is almost as if they were making the holy place or the holy of holies into a marketplace. And this makes the main issue crystal clear. God cares about the holiness of the Father's house. The temple is a sacred space. It's not our house, it's God's house. It's not for us primarily, it's for the worship of the holy, holy, holy. And the Father's house is for the Father's worship. And this is what consumes Jesus consumes him to the point of making a whip out of whatever he could find. And this is meant to, to grab our attention. It's meant to arrest us. We're meant to hear the whip cracking here in this sanctuary right now. And it's what his disciples remembered when they saw Jesus clear the temple that we're supposed to remember too. Keeping the worship of the Father sacred is more important than keeping up religious appearances. Genuine worship is more valuable to God than an abundance of animals for sacrifice or for anything else that we could do. And there's nothing greater for Jesus or any of us to become hot and bothered about than the worship of God. We have no greater passion than God himself. 
We want the world to be just as zealous, just as in awe, just as delighted in our Heavenly Father, in our Savior Jesus Christ, in our life giver, the Holy Spirit. And, and yet, like the noise of a busy marketplace, there, there are many other things that distract us from our central concern for God and for reverence. And some will even say today, some Christians will even say today that, in so many words, that reverence and worship, they just aren't relevant anymore. Nobody cares. You got to meet people where they are. You, you have to cater to what's marketable. You have to address what is ever presently popular. I mean, it's Mother's Day after all, so everything about today should be centered on mothers. Well, I think not, and don't get me wrong, I love my mother, and I, I love my wife who's also a mother. God's the one who made mothers, and God made motherhood. It, it's a good gift he created. Motherhood was God's idea. And motherhood, we should also say, has fallen on hard times today. Right now, uh, the birth rate is at an all-time low in our country. And so what that means is more women need to get married and more women need to have babies and more women need to raise godly families. Amen? In fact, this summer I will be uh, doing a series all on just relationships, taking a break from John, and we'll be focusing on relationships of all kinds, uh, but motherhood, the family, marriage will be one of them. So we will be spending uh, some time on that. So it's not to say that we can't talk about motherhood, but as we happen to be in John 2, it brings to the forefront what is the central concern of all of our mothers in the Lord which is also the central concern of this sanctuary and of this pulpit. And I think if I made motherhood our central concern today, I think I would be the one getting batted on the head by those mother whacking sticks on my way out this morning. Because all good Christian mothers know that reverence is the church's greatest relevance. Reverence is the church's greatest relevance relevance. Not anything else that the world claims is relevant. And this is why pursuing relevance for its own sake is a short-sighted goal. If you put relevance before reverence, you'll get neither. In fact, if you put relevance before reverence, you'll destroy both. Because what is more relevant than knowing God? Anyone? You want to offer some suggestions? What is more relevant than coming to know the source of all existence, coming to know the meaning of life, coming to know and have eternal life? Anything? Uh, I'll figure that stuff out tomorrow. You know, I've got to get to work. I've got to take my kids to practice. I've got to be a good mother, after all. I've got to check my notifications and my messages. I've got to watch the Giants lose another game. <laughs> too much? Too much? <laughs> no. That one's just for me. Okay. But if you're an unbeliever this morning, and you've never called out for salvation in Jesus' name, then like the crack of a whip, you need to hear his words to you in Luke when he says, fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And the things you've prepared, the things you've spent all your time on, whose will they be? Trust in Jesus and be saved. Know God. Have eternal life. Be free from your sin and your guilt. Christian, if anything is replacing the worship of God in your life or hindering your worship of God, that thing, whatever it is, has become a sin. If your zeal for gathering on church with the saints to worship God is diminishing, if your zeal for personal worship of the Lord through reading his word and prayer and even singing his name is lacking, 
if your zeal, not just for yourself, but for others to do these things, for others to know the Lord, for others to, to worship him is diminishing. Well, Jesus is standing with a whip in his hand. And I suggest you clean house before he does or your mother does. But back to John 2, now in verse 18. What do the religious leaders do? How do they respond? Jesus is standing right in front of them, still with the whip in his hand, I imagine. How do they respond? Well, the Jews said to him, the Jews, by the way, is a technical title, really, for the religious leadership. What sign do you show us for doing these things? They respond to Jesus with questions of authority rather than a cry of confession. They ask, who do you think you are? Rather than, what have we done? Of all people, they should be most ashamed, most stricken of heart. They, they are supposed to be leaders in zeal for the Lord's worship. They're supposed to be the ones who, above all people, guard the worship of the, of the Lord. But all they could think to do was to question Jesus, to question God. What right do you have to mess with my business? This is what they're saying. Now, for a moment, we, we may wonder whether perhaps we're just being too harsh with these religious leaders. After all, if anyone this morning you know, grabbed some cords and started whipping people, we would probably have the same response. We, we would probably question what in the world was going on there, too. In a way, it would be my duty to be the first one to do it, to grab the whip out of that person's hand. But if their question was genuine, they would investigate further into just who Jesus was. And very soon, they would discover that he indeed was the Messiah. More than that, the God-man, the Son of God, who is chief authority in his Father's house who has every right to clear it out, even if he uses a whip. And if they found out that he was the Almighty God, they would indeed fall on their faces before him and thank him for only using a whip, for, for not doing something worse, something worse like remember the fire that came out of the Holy of Holies and consumed Nadab and Abihu when they offered strange fire in worship. That could have happened. Or like uh, Uzzah, who was stricken dead the moment he touched the ark. Or we could say like the eternal fire and the absence of God's presence that is in hell. But as time will tell, the religious leaders, they were driven by less than sincerity. Uh, they didn't have sincere motives when they questioned Jesus. And Jesus, in fact, confronts them about this very thing in, in the book of Matthew when he answered them, an, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. They don't care about restoring worship. Uh, two weekends ago, if you count this last weekend, so just over a week ago, was the uh, Iron Sharpens Iron Conference over at uh, Hickman Community Church, and Dr. Nicholas Ellen was there. And he had some pretty good quotes, and they, they relate directly to this kind of a thing. He said what these religious leaders were doing, he was in a different passage, but same idea. Uh, they, were, they were getting all intelligent. That's what they were doing. Like the woman at the well, they wanted to talk theology instead of talking personally. Don't get intelligent with me. Are you making excuses? Or are you making confessions? Are you making excuses? Or are you making confessions? When we hear these words, we, we do find out that Jesus' words are more forceful than his whip. His words do drive us to confession. He has a sharp, two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And its piercing effect is not reserved just for these religious leaders way back 2,000 years ago, but for all of us. As God says to all mankind in Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God is revealed. It's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, all of it, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Every generation has proved themselves to be the kind of 
evil and adulterous generation that asks signs of God. Because in the depraved heart of man lies an impulse to suppress the truth of God. Not to go searching, not to have an honest discovery, not to do a research paper and to come to the right conclusion about whether or not God exists, but to have the truth that we do have about God and to suppress it, to bury it, to smother it in a long list of sins and rebellion and to pretend like it's not real, doesn't exist, and I could put it behind me. And if you need further convincing of this, well, uh, let, let's go to the Ten Commandments. Why don't we do that? And, and I'm not so much interested in the ones that we normally think about either. This might be a little revealing to you. The last six commandments, those are the ones we usually think about. Those are the easy ones, you know, like, oh, you know, have you lied? Have you stolen? Have you cheated? Uh, have you uh, coveted, murdered, so on? I, I don't want to talk about those. I want to talk about the forgotten four, the, the first four. Now we might as well just go through them together. Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Anyone got that one figured out? Have you uh, had no other gods but the Yahweh of the scriptures, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit? Have you worshipped him all your life and no one else? Not even yourself. Uh, Verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. Do I have any idols in my life? Do do, do I uh, put anything above God Or have I allowed anything to distract me from God? Any people that I've prioritized? Any tasks that I've put first before God and his worship? Verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Have I always honored God with the way I talk about him? Not just have I said OMG, but have every word that I have, have had to speak of God has been the best words I could think of. Every time I talk about God, I, I, I speak poetry. I, I speak proclamation. I speak praise every time. I don't take the Lord's name in vain, not me. And one more, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. If I set apart the Lord's day as holy, as sacred, as special, has it been cherished by me as the most special day of my week. And the worship that I get to do there is the the greatest thing I can do. I've always felt that way my whole life, of course. You see, before we ever get to the six commands dealing with each other, we, we find that we've already stumbled and fallen over on our faces before God. And these four commands are much more severe to violate than any of the other six because each one of these that I violate is a direct assault on God himself. So uh, we find ourselves then not much different than the religious leaders if we're honest. But you know then it, it does get worse before it gets better because up until now we've only been talking about like temple worship. We've been talking about a building uh, that existed 2,000 years ago, or, or if you like, we've been talking about, you know, this gathered worship, this building, or my private devotionals, or something like that. It, it does get worse, because something greater than the temple was there and is here. Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When Jesus says destroy this temple, he's speaking of himself. You see, Jesus' cleansing of the temple, it it was not really uh, done for the temple's sake. It was done to make a larger point. He hadn't come to restore proper temple worship. He wasn't about to set up shop and take over their positions of leadership and make sure that the temple worship was restored. No, Jesus knew the temple was temporary. He knew the temple was temporary and a greater, greater, temper, a greater temple was necessary. That greater temple was himself, as we have already read in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son coming from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
I've pointed this out before, but amazingly, the, the word dwelt here is the same word used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, New Testament's in Greek, for the tabernacle, the tabernacle, which is the tent of meeting where God's presence would be in Israel, where he would reside and be manifested uh, as they wandered through the wilderness and before the temple was built, which took the tabernacle's place. So in other words, we could read John 1.14 this way, the word became flesh and tabernacled or templed among us. And we've seen his glory. Jesus is now the place of God's glory. The full manifestation of his presence because he is himself God among us. The very thing that the temple was created to do has happened in Christ and he is standing right in front of them. But they didn't care. They already destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and they will try to destroy the spiritual temple, God himself, by nailing him to a cross. Jesus, he foresees that their questioning now would lead to a final rejection of his authority later. One that, amazingly, is also foretold in Psalm 69. We pointed this out last week, we'll point it out again. If you read Psalm 69, which is the, the passage that the disciples remember, if you read that against John 2, there are so many parallels, and I can only bring out some of them, but this is one of them. Later on in Psalm 69, it says, Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Let their own table before them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Note that not only does this point to the cross where Jesus was given sour wine, but, but also in this mention of the tables, I, I think we're supposed to be seeing here a fulfillment in Jesus' overturning of the tables, that this psalm is meant to be recalled as Jesus disrupts the peace of their tables, their business in the temple. And then, of course, John 19, we see it completely fulfilled when Jesus is on the cross. Knowing that all was now finished, he said to fulfill the scripture, Psalm 69, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is our great salvation, but how we got here is our great shame. Because the religious leaders, whom we are very much like, had nothing to give Jesus but the sour wine of their unbelief and of their rejection. All mankind is guilty on the cross, not just them. John 3, 19 tells us this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Jesus' cleansing of the temple in John 2 is about so much more than the temple. It's about so much more than money changers and animal sellers. It's about so much more than religious leaders. That This is about, it's about us. It's about the depraved zeal of man, my depraved zeal, that destroys worship. And before the cross can save us, it must first cause us to weep and to confess how bad things are. So what am I doing with the worship of God? Am I destroying it? Am I perverting it? Am I overlooking it? Am I obscuring it? Am I suppressing? And if we're honest, we have to say yes to all of these questions in different ways. And our response is very simple. It is to say, I confess. I have this heart. I find it too easy to do all the things that obscure the worship of God, I confess. I cannot hide from the whip of Jesus, nor say I don't deserve it. I cannot hide from the piercing words from his mouth, but neither do I want to hide. I won't question him. I won't say, how dare you? 
How dare you overturn my tables? How dare you drive out my sheep and oxen? How dare you make a mess with my life, my money? I welcome his cleansing. I welcome his reproof. And pray he increases my faith, he increases my zeal to be like his for my Father in Jesus' name. No excuses, just confessions. No resistance, just acceptance. No denial, just contrition. But we also hope that there's a cure, don't we? What can change our heart? What can take this depraved zeal and replace it with something else? Well, there is another zeal in our text, a zeal that goes beyond the cross, one that is of God and that has greater power than our own depraved zeal, and that is the resurrection zeal of Jesus Christ. Jesus' resurrection zeal is what restores worship. Jesus' resurrection zeal restores our worship. Destroy this temple, Jesus said, and in three days I will raise it up. Verse 22, when therefore his disciples, uh, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Jesus was not about to let some irreligious, self-absorbed leaders of the temple win. Their depraved zeal, your depraved zeal, my depraved zeal is no match for Jesus' zeal. Because his zeal can satisfy divine wrath. Jesus' zeal can cleanse the soul. Jesus' zeal can raise the dead. And this is the only sign that he wants to give us. This is the proof that he would give to them and to us. As he also said in Matthew 12, he said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but... No sign will be given to it except, except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the, uh, in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But just three days, not longer. Incredibly, even this sign, the resurrection, is also there in Psalm 69. I have to point this out to us. It's there in seed form, you might say, but listen to the words of Psalm 69, which also match up with the prayer of Jonah in the belly of the fish. This is what David says that I think is also meant to remind us of what Jesus is saying on the cross. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the uh, deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. Oh, indeed, Jesus was delivered. The temple in Jerusalem could be destroyed, but Jesus could not. And worship would not come through a a rebuilding of temple grounds, but a reviving of Jesus' body. He was raised from the ground and to the right hand of the majesty on high. He was set on high. And the disciples tell us this, one more passage about this in Acts chapter 2. And Peter says, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he's at my right hand that I may not be shaken. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. This is God's sign to every generation, God's proof, God's zeal, the resurrection zeal of Christ. Do do you see it and do you believe like the disciples do? Do you know how zealous Jesus is for you? How zealous he is for your salvation? He was whipped for it. He hung on a cross for it. He went to the grave for it. He was buried in a tomb for it. And he burst out of that grave to secure it. 
Jesus wants you to know how severe the problem is, and that's why he brought a whip to the temple, but Jesus also wants you to know how far he was willing to go to fix it. He gave his own life for it. And he gives us all this one sign, the sign of his resurrection zeal to prove to you that salvation is real, that it is possible, and that it is yours, no matter how zealous you have been to destroy the worship of God. Jesus' zeal is more. Jesus' zeal brings life out of death. See it and believe him. And take heart, mothers. Take heart, fathers and sons and daughters, neighbors and friends. Take heart, every Christian, because you know that there is no hardened heart that the Lord cannot crack. There's no ruined life that the resurrection cannot revive. No sin that the Lord was not willing to suffer and die to rid us of. His zeal is stronger, it goes deeper, it penetrates further, and it restores all. And the same resurrected zeal of our Lord is the one that's set on bringing us home. He is zealous for us, he loves us, and he will take us to himself. Once again, this is, I think, prophesied in Psalm 69 when it says, God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah. People shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. We see it at the end of the book. I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. No zeal can match our Lord's. No zeal can make this happen. No zeal but God's. A zeal for cleaning house of all of our sin. A zeal for you to be turned, for you to be saved, for you to be forgiven and resurrected. A zeal for you to be with him forever. Jesus is aggressively zealous for worship. And though man's depraved zeal destroys worship and does so time and again and certainly in our time, when Jesus rose from the grave, he proved that he has zeal to restore our worship and to perfect it for all time. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you, first of all, that you are more than willing to speak the truth to us, to demonstrate it, the, the passion that you have, uh, to not condone, to not comply or compromise with the many ways that we have taken from ourselves what is most precious what is life itself, and that is the worship of our God, the knowledge of our Savior. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of this. And I do pray, Lord, for anyone who maybe has never confessed Christ, never turned to him and asked, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I confess this is my sin and I need salvation. Pray, Lord, they would say that this morning and say, Lord Jesus, save me. Forgive me. Change my heart and make it new by the Spirit that I might have zeal for the Lord too, now and forever. For all of us, Lord, I pray you would renew and awaken and rekindle week by week, day by day, this zeal that we see in Jesus' eyes. 
And Lord, that we would share that zeal with others. Share that zeal with a world that is lost and despondent in darkness. They need the light, Lord. Lord Jesus, you are that light. You are my Savior. And we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.